Welcome to the Big Bass Podcast. My name is Terry Battisti. And I'm Ken Duke. Our producer and engineer is none other than Nathan Benson. This episode of the Big Bass Podcast is Westmoreland, Legend of the Lake. And it's about Billy Westmoreland, who is probably the only angler in history ever to catch both a largemouth bass and a smallmouth bass weighing more than 10 pounds. He was an early BASS tournament standout, a finesse guru, and even a television host. He once saved the life of Bass Pro Shops founder Johnny Morris, and he wrote three books on bass fishing. And if you're wondering who the greatest smallmouth angler of all time is, you don't have to look any further than Billy Westmoreland. So That's right, Terry. What I you, agree with you, man. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Billy Millard Westmoreland, Ken? Yeah, uh, Billy Westmoreland was born in 1937 in a little town called Salina, Tennessee, which uh, would, would have disappeared to history probably, except for the fact that it is behind the dam that forms Dale Hollow Lake. Far and away, the greatest and most historic producer of world-class smallmouth bass. Yep. Dale Hollow has produced most of the world's smallmouths weighing 10 pounds or more. Um, Billy was a big, heavy set guy, even as a youth. He was a, a standout defensive tackle for Selena High School. He was a third team, all mid-state in 1955. Uh, once he graduated, he was a high school football coach. He was yep. a successful national tournament pro. He designed some baits and even manufactured baits for a while. He hosted a TV show in the 1980s called Billy Westmoreland's Fishing Diary. And he was a mentor to a lot of the guys out at Dale Hollow who are still fishing the lake today. Yeah, you know, I mean, he was a mentor in many ways. And, and one of the biggest ways that he was a mentor was in what we call today finesse fishing. Uh, they didn't call it that back then. But, I mean, he was fishing four, six, eight-pound line uh, way back when. And, and and this is one of the reasons, I think, that, that he had a tremendous tournament career when he decided to go start fishing – the Bassmaster Trail, uh, and it, he stayed out of the Bassmaster Trail until 1972. The first year that he fishes the Bassmaster Trail, he makes the classic, and he did it six years in a row. Uh, he won the 1974 Florida Invitational on the St. Johns River. He fished and won the 1975 Florida Invitational again on the St. Johns River. And then he won the 1977 Arkansas Invitational on Greer's Ferry uh, and got big bass at the tournament, which was a 914. Uh, the guy was a stud. Um, and then in, uh, he, he was, a, again, a six-time qualifier for the Bassmaster Classic. He had uh, finished ninth uh, three times uh, in Angler of the Year, 73, 74, and 76. He had four top ten finishes. I mean, the guy was a stud. But what killed him was 1978 when Ray Scott implemented the 14-inch size limit uh, in Bassmaster. And, you know, yeah, Billy could catch big fish, but his first goal in a tournament was to go out and get limits of 12-inch fish uh, because he felt that once he had a limit, and back then it was 10 fish. Uh, and then, heck, it was 10 fish through 70, 78, I believe. And maybe seven at, at seven, no, 77, I think it went to seven fish, right? Yeah. And, and you know, Billy was not the only guy who was a finesse guy back then. You had a guy like Roger Moore from Missouri. Yeah. Uh, when they, when they increased the, the size of it from 12 to 14 inches, it really hurt a lot of guys. Uh, oh, yeah. And Billy Westmoreland was probably on the top of that list uh, in the, terms of the most vocal, angler. the most vocal, at least. And he fished three tournaments in 78, the first three Bassmaster tournaments. And he he only weighed in like two pounds in one event, four pounds in another event, and 10 pounds in another event. Uh, and that 10th time he weighed 10 pounds, it wasn't even in the top 100. It was the top, it was 100 place finishes all three tournaments, and he quit. And when he quit, that's when he went to fish American Bass Federation, uh, American Bass Fisherman, ABF. Uh, and he fished them until they folded, and then National Bass bought him, uh, and then they folded in 1980, and that ended Billy's professional fishing career with respect to tournaments. And, of course, then he moved into television with uh, Billy Westmoreland's Fishing Diary. But, you know, yeah. Terry, the thing that uh, – one of Billy's biggest impacts on the history of our sport 
Oh God! Doesn't doesn't technically have anything to do with fishing. Tell us about that. Oh, he saved Johnny Morris's life. I, I mean, literally, literally yeah. saved his life. So at the the 1973 Beaver uh, Lake, it was a, the 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 Arkansas Invitational on Beaver Lake. Um, I think they called it the maybe it was the All American again. Um, just for you know old time's sake. Uh, it was the Arkansas they, Invitational. Yeah, and and so they. It's a cold day. I mean, it's like 35 degrees outside. The wind's blowing. Um, and literally, they're going down the lake. The, the, the boat swamps, fills up with water, and sinks. And the only thing that was floating around near them was one of – it was their red gas can. And you're talking about Johnny Morris, the founder of Bass Pro Johnny, Shops. His, Johnny Morris. His boat sinks. Yeah. And uh, they're bobbing out there and probably, you know, three foot, four foot – wind waves uh water temperatures 40 degrees the wind's blowing it's nasty they're so desperate that they pull out their keys and they start scratching trying to scratch a note to to someone saying that they love them and you know they died on the lake and blah 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 and from afar billy sees this red thing bobbing out in, in the in the lake and goes over there and lo and behold there's two guys hanging on to this red gas can and it's one of the old six gallon you know gas cans that we used to use in our boats and uh reaches down and billy westmoreland i mean he had he had catcher's mitts for hands he was a big boy grabs from the story that i've heard is that he grabs johnny morris by the by the, the the neck and and just with one hand brings him into the into the boat the other guy and literally saves him and, and the other guy was uh, an angler named Robert Craddock yeah and uh, he pulls him in saves their lives hypothermia was minutes away from yeah. taking these guys and if you go away. if you go to the bass pro shops uh He's got a, a little museum in the, the, the area that you don't have to pay to get into, the Wonders of Wildlife, uh, that is a mock-up of the old Brown Derby. And in there, <clears throat> he has essentially a shrine to Billy Westmoreland thanking him for saving his life. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really, really cool. Because if Johnny Morris had died that day, I mean – what would bass fishing be like today? And he was about to. He was just about to die that day in 1973 before Westmoreland saved him. And and, and Johnny Morris obviously uh, remembered that. And yeah. and it was shortly after. And, and Billy Westmoreland was not just the greatest smallmouth fisherman of all time, I think hands down, without any serious competition. But, but Billy Westmoreland was one of the great anglers, one of the great bass anglers of all time, period. Yeah. He could catch... He gets brown fish, green fish, you name it. And uh, after he saves Johnny Morris's life, one of the ways Johnny repaid him for that was he uh, he started introducing things like Billy, a line of Billy Westmoreland fishing rods. Signature series program. rods, yeah. Mm -hmm. Signature series rods. I've got one in the garage. Uh, he introduced, he, and, and I believe, I believe this is correct. I know it was correct for at least many, many, many years. Uh, every year, uh, Billy Westmoreland got not one, but two uh, boats from Nitro and Tracker. He got a Nitro every year. He got a Tracker every year, basically for the rest of his life. Yeah. I. Uh, what's the cost of a life? I mean, I mean, Johnny Morris is, yeah, I mean, it kind of shows you what kind of guy that, that, that Johnny Morris is. I mean, it, yeah, obviously very appreciative for what, what Billy Westmoreland ultimately meant to him. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, Billy Westmoreland's had such an interesting career because not only does he save Johnny Morris's life, who's had such a major impact on the sport, uh, not only is he, is he the greatest smallmouth bass angler of all time, I think indisputably so. Yeah. Uh, Billy Westmoreland wrote books about bass fishing that were incredibly influential and important to our sport. And uh, none more so, Terry, than the one you're holding up right now, uh, Them Old Brown Fish, Billy yeah. Westmoreland on Smallmouth Bass. Uh, that was published in 1976. Yep. Uh, the byline is Billy Westmoreland as told to Larry Mayer. Yep. And Larry Mayer was a, a, a very underrated outdoor writer 
who uh, was a longtime editor of the uh, the state newspaper's outdoor column in South Carolina. He he co-wrote the Billy Westmoreland book. He later co-wrote uh, a Billy Westmoreland book about largemouth bass. He co-wrote the Roland Martin's 101 uh, Bass Catching Secrets book. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Billy, uh, Billy Westmoreland was working with one of the best when he was working with Larry Mayer. And yeah. and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out there. You tell me if you agree. I think them old brown fish is the seminal work on smallmouth bass fishing. Oh, there's no argument with that. Zero argument. I mean, it it. I remember when I got this book. I think I got it in '77. Uh, again, it was a probably a Christmas present for my mom. Um, I read this thing cover to cover, like in three days. I was glued to it. Uh, there was, and, and we didn't have smallmouth per se in, in California. We had them in one lake that we could get to. And yet I was buying hoss flies. I was buying silver <laughs> buddies. Uh, I was buying spin rights. Uh, had to go spin rights. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, it changed the way that I looked at fishing. And I mean, it, today, everything that's in this book, is still applicable. It's just that nobody does it. You know, if Billy Westmoreland published that book today, if he were alive today and published that book today, it would be an instant classic. Uh, yeah. it, it reminds me tragically of a book that was written five or six years ago by this absolute buffoon <laughs> on smallmouth bass fishing, who uh, in the third sentence, he's got a, a serious factual problem uh, about the size of the world record smallmouth bass. And he does a, uh, a, a little segment on Dale Hollow where he admits that he didn't do any research and I didn't know anything about, I didn't know this lake produced so many giants. A buffoon <laughs> on smallmouth bass. How do you feel about I him? overheard him. <laughs> uh, he's a buffoon. He, I overheard him one time saying, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people consider this to be the Bible of smallmouth bass. Only in your tiny, tiny brain would anybody consider that to be an impressive publication. Yeah. Um, of any kind. I mean, it, 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 it rivals a note left on a piece of toilet paper. Okay. That's so, what it rivals. Okay. Let's, let's not mention titles. Let's not mention titles. No, no, no. We don't want to go there. Uh, okay. All right. But, you know, Westmoreland's influence was primarily smallmouth, but he also wrote a terrific book on largemouth bass called Largemouths and Tournaments, Good or Bad. Yep. He wrote it with the same outdoor writer, Larry Mayer, and he published it just three years after the smallmouth book. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, let's dig into a little bit to, to Westmoreland as a as a character, as a as a commentator, as a very opinionated guy on the sport. And, and Terry, one of the things that amuses <laughs> me about that book is that Billy Westmoreland pretty much hated the technique of flipping. And, and that's what turned me off of that book. It's a great book, <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, I, I bought this book back in probably 1980. Uh, and when I got to that section, I, my brain just shut off. It, it just kind of internally exploded. It's like, says how, the California guy, says oh, the California you know, guy. D, D Thomas. I mean, holy crap. And we all looked up to D and Dave Gleeby and Gary Klein. I mean, how can you, how can you diss flipping? I mean, it just, you know, I don't know. Well, the it's two just, things that West so, said about flipping. Yeah. Where one and I, I and if you read it, if you read the passage in his large mouth book, I think it's fair to say that Westmoreland did not understand flipping as Dean yeah. Thomas introduced it to the world. Uh, first of all, he said it did not start in California. He says they were doing flipping at Dale Hollow 30 years earlier, which would have been in the 1940s. Uh, but what he's really talking about is they were doing some variation of what would be called Thule dipping. Yeah. And, and the other or thing I would say, or whatever word you wanted to call yeah, it. Yeah, dabbling, something like that. Uh, jigger pulling. <laughs> jigger yep. pulling would be mm-hmm. another term for it. Um, and and Westmoreland had a problem with it, too, because he felt like it was so easy to back end a guy. He thought it should be outlawed in tournaments, and he thought it was a bad mistake uh, for any organization to allow it in tournaments because he thought it would allow to uh, allow too much for back ending and things like that. Yeah. Uh, that the guy in the front was the only guy who had a real shot at the fish. But uh, those are perhaps a shortcoming of Billy Westmoreland, but uh, you can't take anything away from the man as an angler, as a theorist, as a communicator, and as a mentor. He was top notch. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, there's no other way to describe it. He was just, he was amazing. I mean, and, and he didn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk. I mean, the guy would go out, out at three o'clock in the morning, you know, just to go fish for smallmouth on Dale Hollow. Um, oh, it, I mean, he, he was, he was 100% about catching the bass and it didn't matter. I mean, if he was in Florida, he won both of those Florida tournaments fishing eight pound line and finesse worms. And that's how JW lures came up with a sweet willy worm, which was one of the first, you know, small diameter plastic worms made so you could get a hook through it easier on lighter line. I mean, yeah, Westmoreland knew how to use casting gear, but I would say 99% of the time he just simply chose not to do it. Yeah. Because he felt like he would get a lot more bites using line testing, say, between four and 10 pound tests. And this was back in the days mm-hmm. of monofilament when, when yeah. braid and fluorocarbon were not available, much less an option. Yeah, well, I mean, braid was available, but it was Dacron and it's. Yeah, you it couldn't was, use it. it. You primitive. Couldn't, yeah. And, uh, but, I mean, he would use casting gear on lines 10-pound and heavier. So 10 to 12, like if he was, you know, throwing a bigger jig or throwing a crankbait, a bigger crankbait or, uh, uh, you know, something like a spin right. Okay? Um, but if he was fishing a hoss fly or, or, you know, a little worm or something like that, he was, he was throwing a spinning rod. It's the now, third book. Anybody who's been watching the show for a while here, the Big Bass Podcast for a while, knows how much I love breaking Terry Batiste's heart and reducing him to tears. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got a box of my tears that he covets. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a little – I call it a book. It's really a booklet, as you can see. It's very, very small. But this is something that Terry Batiste does not have. And so it breaks his heart. Yeah. And this is Billy Westmoreland on my 10 best ways – to catch a world record smallmouth bass. I call it Billy's third book on yeah. bass fishing. And it's fascinating. The only place you could find it was back in the day, shortly after Westmoreland's death in 2002, if you happened to be at Horse Creek Resort. You could go out to Horse Creek Resort, and uh, uh, Jack Huddleston had a stack of these at the cash register. And from Horse Creek, Horse Creek Resort, you could look across the, the cove, across the creek there, and you could see Billy's actual home up on the hill across the lake, which is also very cool. That's awesome. And Billy offers these 10 tips, just as he says in his, in his booklet here, for how to catch a world record smallmouth bass. And I, I think we should share those. Terry, let's, let's go through them here. One, I'm going to go one. You do, the, you do the even numbers. I'll do the odd numbers. Number one, fish, and it's so simple and so obvious but so many people don't pay attention to this fish and water capable of producing a record smallmouth bass and and in billy westmoreland's thoughts and i I tend to still agree dale hollow lake is still the best bet to do that yeah absolutely absolutely number two fish january or december january february and march to the best month because the big females are starting to develop eggs uh, in December, and they carry them through March or early April. And so that's the best time that you're going to have to catch a big smallmouth. There you go. Number three, according to Bill, none other than Billy Westmoreland, there are certain areas of Dale Hollow that have always produced big smallmouth, these being areas known as the flats, old road beds, and humps, which are plentiful in the cold weather months if you know where to look. Yeah. Points are a good place to start. Start shallow on top and you want, to, you want to focus on the ones that are shallow on top and are deep on one side. Yeah. The next, number four, would be the world record that I hooked on Christmas Day, 1970. And we're going to get into that fish in, in a little bit here. Uh, anyway, he caught that fish on an old roadbed on top of a point that dropped off to 55 feet on the side. And the, the big fish struck in 20 feet of water right on the break as I pulled a yellow marabou spin right off the bottom. Westmoreland recommended a lure made in eastern Kentucky called the marabou spin, uh, the next lure that uh, is equally as good as the silver buddy lure. Number five, Westmoreland caught 
two bass, two small mouths over 10 pounds and multiple large mouths over 10 pounds, making him the only guy. I think he's the only guy ever to catch a, a, a double digit large mouth and a double digit small mouth, but he caught multiple double digit small mouths and double and, and multiple double digit large mouths. He says the 10 pound small mouth he caught in 1972 was called an eighth ounce jig. And he believed that the leadhead jig was a great lure if it's small and that you can get away the big jig if you're fishing at night. Mm -hmm. Number six, lead heads with small plastic grubs have been a great producer for me as well. I have caught several big smallmouth on spinnerbaits at night, but my biggest came one early morning on a point in Horse Creek. It weighed nine pounds, 15 ounces. I was fishing a single spin at daylight one January morning. The temperature was 15 above zero. Yeah, those are the words of Billy Westmoreland, folks. Also, number seven, learn to use the depth finder to parallel the shoreline and keep the lure in 18 to 35 feet of water uh, on flats that drop off on one side of deep water. He thought that was a magical range. He thought yeah. that smallmouth bass are rarely shallower than big smallmouth bass, world-class smallmouth bass were rarely shallower than 18 feet. Yeah. Then you have eight. Yes, there are some crankbaits that will work well for big smallmouth in cold water. The best crankbait is the Hot Lips, Lure Jensen Hot Lips Express, by far and away. This lure is the right size, has the right wiggle, and will get to the deep depths for the big smallmouth and just maybe that world record. Number nine, live bait is great. Westmoreland <laughs> was not shy about fishing live bait. If that's what mm -hmm. it takes to catch a big one, he's all in. Yep. And number 10, the final, I will be the first to say that I have never caught a world record smallmouth bass, nor that I may ever catch one. But I will say to you that I did have a smallmouth bass on on Christmas Day at around 2 p.m. in the year 1970. I truthfully expect to catch the world record smallmouth bass each and every time I go fishing. You know, Terry, we talked about early at the show here, we talked about the fact that Westmoreland is probably the only guy to catch a 10 pound largemouth and a 10 pound smallmouth. Um, yeah. Uh, now, the largemouth, you know, is relatively easy, obviously. Largemouth bass in the double digits are caught pretty much every day of the year yep. uh, in multiple places around the country. Uh, as far as finding substantiation for the fact that Westmoreland did it, one of the easy places to find it is in some articles that were done uh, in the late 70s and in his, in his largemouths book. Uh, back in the late 70s, when U.S. travel to Cuba was briefly opened, uh, he and some other fishing industry people went out to Lake Zaza. Yep. There are two famous lakes in Cuba. One is Zaza, the other is Treasure Lake. Yep. And, and at Zaza, Westmoreland's two biggest fish were 11 and 10 and a half pounds. And he was so impressed, Terry, with that fishery that he predicted Lake Zaza was going to produce a world record largemouth within just a few years. Yeah. Tell us about the smallmouths. So the smallies, I mean, and, and you know, I got a, a picture of them I held up a little bit earlier. There's, there's Westmoreland with two tens. Um, he got the 10-0 uh, March 29th, 1970, out of Dale Hollow, of course. Um, and then he caught a 10-1 or a 10-0, depending upon, you know, what you read. Uh, there were separate scales. Uh, it was caught March 17th, 1972, again on Dale Hollow. And that was the fish that was caught on the 1 8 ounce hoss fly uh, in 25 feet of water off of the old roadbed with ultralight spinning gear, four-pound line. Uh, the interesting thing about the hoss fly is that it was it was a – what I would call an aspirin head, uh, and it had bear hair, black bear hair on it. And there were times when he would tip it with a 101 pork frog from Uncle Josh or a U2 uh, Uncle Josh eel, uh, double tail. And uh, yeah. that is what he swore about, was, was that damn hoss fly and pork. You know, in recent years, Terry, there's been a, a big buzz about hair jigs yeah. and this is just very retro because this is exactly what Westmoreland was preaching 50 and 60 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's nothing new in bass fishing can. I mean, he, <laughs> you know, everybody's coming out with a new lure and, and no, it's not new. If you look back a hundred years at, 
someone came up with it a hundred years ago. Yeah. It, there's nothing new. But, you know, uh, it's great that Westmoreland caught these couple of small mouths over 10 pounds and multiple large mouths over 10 pounds. Yeah. Uh, but our show today is is really primarily about a potential world record he lost on Christmas Day, 1970. And yeah. to help set, set the stage a little bit for that, I want to remind everybody that the world record smallmouth bass weighed 11 pounds, 15 ounces. It was caught by a gentleman named David Lee Hayes on Dale Hollow Lake, the same place that Billy Westmoreland was known as the legend of the lake. Uh, Hayes caught the world record on, on July 9th, 1955. Uh, Westmoreland would have been 18 years old. And uh, so he would have absolutely known that this fish was taken. Yep. By the way, Westmoreland started guiding. Westmoreland started <laughs> guiding for money on, on Dale Hollow Lake when he was 12 years old. Yeah. Okay. So, and by the time he was 13, he was widely regarded as one of the best fishermen on the lake. Yeah. So that he hooks into the fish of a billion lifetimes on Christmas day, 1970 was no surprise. Tell us about that cat. Tell, well, well, I'm sorry, uh, not a catch, but a, but a hookup. Yeah. So what I want to talk about first though, is, is Hayes's method of fishing. And I think Hayes was of the Buck Perry mindset with respect to trolling. And he trolled, yes. a, a, he trolled a bomber. Uh, he was 600 let, series bomber, 600 yeah. series bomber, uh, that they would troll three, four, 500 yards behind the boat at times to get down into that 30 and 40 foot of water. And, you know, David Hayes caught a lot of big smallmouth out of Dale hollow. Westmoreland's approach was completely different and, and more what we would call contemporary, i.e. setting up on structure and casting at, at, you know, the areas that, that he knew that these big fish would be in. And so on Christmas day, Westmoreland, you know, catches the hooks into this fish. Uh, and, and what he said is, as far as I know, I've seen one small mouth in my life that probably weighed from 12 to 14 pounds. This is the only one that I can say for sure that I know was that big. I had it hooked I had it to the boat two or three different times and got a good look at it at several times in very clear water. Now, and, and you know, Terry's quoting from them old brown fish, which was Billy Westmoreland's book from yep. 1976, still the standard of smallmouth bass fishing. Yeah. And when you, when you look at, 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 at Westmoreland, I mean, he has two fish that are over 10. He's got fish, multiple fish in the seven to nine pound class. He knows what a fish of that caliber looks like. Uh, and, you know, for him to say it was 12 to 14, it must have been. It must have 12 been to 14. It must have been 12 <laughs> to 14 pounds. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, so, you know, he, he also goes on to say further in that story that I know how big it was because I had a couple of seven or eight pounders in the live well at the time. So he had just put his hands on an eight, okay? And this fish is possibly, you know, 50, 60% bigger than the one that he had in his live well. And, uh, I mean, it's just insane. So, Ken, you want to finish the story? Well, you know, since we've started the Big Bass Podcast, a number of people have asked us, will the smallmouth record ever be broken? And I, I usually say that uh, I don't think it's going to be broken in my lifetime. And we're going to get into that David Hayes story uh in a multiple multiple episode series coming up soon but uh yeah. westmoreland asked himself in in them old brown fish he said will the world's record smallmouth ever be broken uh he says if it is broken it'll be broken at dale hollow because i know for sure that i had one on which was the world's record and there's no reason why there aren't more that size in the lake uh his his passage about that fish terry uh blows me away and i revisit it from time to time yeah and and, and i want to share the highlights with our, our vi viewers and listeners yeah uh, and, and pretty much everything i say from here for several moments is going to be a quote yeah when i hooked this big smallmouth, which i'm sure would have been the world record i was fishing the pedigo spin right which was a tail spinner uh about 2 30 p.m on that christmas day it was cold windy and very rough weather 
the waves were really rolling in on the points I was fishing. I was by myself and had about a limit of bass in the boat at the time. I had a couple of five to six pound small mouths and a seven pound large mouth. I've seen big small mouths hit as good, but never better than they did on that day. So at that point, Westmoreland pulls into an area where he'd hooked into some big small mouths in the past. And he was fishing this Pedigo spin right again, which is a tail spinner style lure. I threw the spin right in and this fish hit about 12 to 14 feet deep right on the drop off. I didn't get a look at the fish for a pretty good while. It made a real long run and pulled a lot of line off. After it surfaced and wallowed around on top of the water, I got a pretty good look at it, but it was so far away that at the time I really couldn't tell if it was a seven pounder or a 10 pounder. I just knew it was a real big fish. I used, it was so rough. And, and he's going to tell us about how rough it was out there right now. He says, I used a big motor to follow it. Westmoreland <laughs> had to get behind the console and fire up the outboard to get out of that area and follow this fish. Yeah. And then I used a trolling motor when I got into a little protected area. I gained a lot of line when it went out into deeper water toward the fish. Finally, the fish came up 30 to 40 feet from the boat. And I got a real good look at it when it came up and wallowed on the surface. I can't describe how I felt, except I got very nervous, which I seldom <laughs> ever do. It was because I really knew what I had. I couldn't believe how big it was. Yeah. The fish went back down and then came back up and began tiring a little bit. I got her up again a little close, and she tried to get out of the water. And she went 8 to 10 feet with her head and part of her body out of the water. She never could get all the way out. I still couldn't believe it. I turned her a little bit and she came toward the boat and I got her right under the boat, nine or 10 feet of water. And I got another real good look at her. I could see the line coming out of her mouth and the spin right was completely out of sight down in her mouth. I felt real good at that point as I thought she was probably hooked down in the triangle of her gills. She went down and I put a little pressure on her and she turned and went out toward the back of the boat and swung around and came a little closer this time. If I had had a net in the boat, I could have caught the fish at this time. But anyway, she was within 10 feet of the boat, and I turned her real easy. And she swung toward the boat, and I picked up a little line. And probably as she went under the boat, she was no further, no deeper than four feet away. Then she went down. And I had to back off on the reel handle because Billy Westmoreland would have been back reeling. He wouldn't have been using the drag. He'd have been back reeling instead of using a drag. So I had to back off on the reel handle, he says. Then she got down about 15 or 20 feet and the spin right popped out of her mouth. The hooks, uh. hooks weren't straightened out or anything. The lure just came out of her mouth. He lost the fish, Terry. Yeah, he lost the fish of a, a million lifetimes. Which, which is insane because that model spin right that he was throwing had two hooks on it, two trebles, yeah. two trebles. But you know, it, it goes to the fact that smallmouth can grab a hold of a bait so hard that you can't you can't move the bait to set the hook, um, and if it if it was down in her, in her crushers or something like that, I, yeah. I, it, reading the story in the book, I mean, it, it'll, it'll move you, you know, cause I mean, it, he's got so much emotion uh, in those paragraphs that, yeah, you feel for the guy. And you've just, you just touched on the thing that I think makes the story so amazing and made me want to do this episode of the big bass podcast so much because the man lost a giant fish and that happens. Yeah. And if you fish long enough and you fish in the right places, we've all had the experience of losing a big fish that we, we regret we didn't catch. But Westmoreland's story, because of who he was and his background and growing up in that area where Dale Hollow was impounded as he was a young child and where he grew up fishing it, that's where the story gets interesting to me. Because... Um, it's one thing to lose a giant fish, but where Westmoreland takes it from here is so special. He goes on in the book, Them Old Brown Fish, to say, Losing that one disturbed me. 
<laughs> because something I've dreamed of all my life was catching the biggest smallmouth anyone had ever caught. Yeah. Yep. If I didn't say this, I'd be less than truthful. It bothered me so much and to the point where over the next 16 to 18 months that lots of times I'd be home watching television at night and I'd start thinking about that fish. Then I'd think maybe this was the night. The fish might be back on that point. I'd convince myself while I was in the chair watching TV that the fish was on that point waiting. Out the door I'd go, and I'd hook onto the boat, slap that boat in the water, and go fish for a couple of hours. So that's how much it haunted him, Terry Battisti. Oh, yeah. It kept he would up sit there night. and think about it. Oh, yeah. He'd be watching TV yeah. at night, ready to go to bed. But no, he'd think, oh, that fish is ready for me again. It's 2 yeah. o'clock in the morning, but I'm going to hook it up and go. Oh, we've all lost that fish. I lost that fish when I was 15 years old. Uh, you know, it, to this day, it haunts me. Um, yeah, I, I, and it wasn't a world record. It was nowhere near a world record, but it was a 10. And I, I could just imagine what he was feeling because Billy Westmore was a credible dude. You know? Yes. Yes. This is not this is not some <laughs> some jackass who wrote a bass fishing book on smallmouth and thought he set set a new standard in the world of smallmouth, but he's really just an ass clown. Who had never oh, obviously is... who had never obviously read them all brown fish. <laughs> who had never even heard of Billy Holy Westmoreland, probably. Mackerel. Yeah. Uh, this is you... Billy freaking Westmoreland. <laughs> uh, and he goes on, Terry, in the book, Them Old Brown Fish, and he says at this time, I was still living with my parents. Sometimes I'd even be at, in bed at night. And before I'd go to sleep, I'd start thinking about that fish. And out of bed, I'd come. I'd start thinking about that fish. I'd hook up the boat and go fishing and try to catch her. I did this at 3 o'clock in the morning or most any hour. I even worked out a little system. I'd convince myself that 3 o'clock in the morning wasn't any good after I tried to catch her then two nights in a row. I'd time myself so that if I left home at 1.45 a.m., I could be fishing that spot at 2.28 a.m. or something like that. I was so anxious to catch that fish that during those 16 to 18 months, I must have fished 40 to 50 times at night like that. He was ate up. He was absolutely ate up. up. <laughs> and, yeah. and you know what? That kind of eaten up is what creates the greatest smallmouth bass fisherman of all time, Billy Westmoreland. Yeah, because he doesn't want to get beat, you know? I mean... Doesn't want to get beaten by a fish. Right. Doesn't want to get beaten by another by another angler. Doesn't mm -hmm. want to get beaten. Absolutely right. Yep. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, I didn't have the privilege of knowing Billy Westmoreland well, but I did have the, the great privilege of, of meeting him a few times in Salina when I'd go up to Fishdale Hollow with some other friends. And... Uh, there are some things I never got to do the interview I wanted to do with Billy Westmoreland. He passed away in 2002. Way um, early. Way early. Yeah. You know, I foolishly thought, well, I've got plenty of time yeah. to interview this man. Plenty of time. I want to get to know him better. I want, I want him to, to, to realize that I'm, I'm a guy who's as passionate about bass fishing as he is. Yeah. And, and in doing that, I, I blew my opportunity to have the conversation with Billy Westmoreland that I really wanted. But, I can tell you some, I can offer some uh, insight into, into his sense of humor. I think um, I got to see Billy and visit with Billy when he would be in a tackle shop. Uh, That's the best and of time. Course he's, <laughs> he's the, he's the legend of the lake. This man is the legend of the lake. That was his nickname around Dale hollow. And I got to see him around some uh, other anglers, some, some tourists who were coming into Fishdale hollow. Hilarious, Terry. You would never stop laughing if you had been <laughs> shoulder to shoulder with me on those days. Because Westmoreland is saying to them things like, well, now in the morning, you want to be throwing your, your Hot Lips Express in this craw color right here. But about, and, and they're, they're grabbing every Hot Lips Express <laughs> off, the, <laughs> off the pegs at this point. <laughs> and uh, he said, but then about 10, 15 today, you want to switch over to this jig. All the jigs are coming off the pegs now. Yeah. And, and as he's saying this, and they're grabbing everything they can that he's recommending, he'll shoot a glance over at me, and he'll wink. Oh, God. 
But but he's not lying to him either. Well, he's not lying to him. He's maybe steering him down the primrose path a little bit to help that tackle shop owner sell some baits. Yeah. He's not lying. All this stuff works. All this stuff is things are, are things Billy Westmoreland has used to catch uh, great smallmouth bass. But he's he's playing it along a little bit. Yeah. And and he had a wonderful sense of humor. He had he was always joking around, always playing around, and, and that's one of the the great takeaways. I'm so privileged I got to see that out of the man. Yeah. Uh, another quirky thing about him that probably not a lot of people know is that this is the way Billy Westmoreland spelled his name. That's on his birth certificate. That's what his parents did. He had two E's in there. Not only the E in the West, but the E in the more. But this is the way he spelled it in his tournament life and when he signed autographs why because he felt like it was easier to sign <laughs> yeah that and he that's felt... that is something i have always been adamant about spelling his name the correct way without the e and this is the thing that i learned about doing this particular podcast was the, the way that he was born or the way that he, he, you know, what his name was when he was born, not the way that we read it our entire lives and every book or every article that was ever penned by a writer. Yeah, no. Yeah, not only is his name mis technically misspelled on all of his books, um, with the exception of the last one, the last one has it spelled correctly, the little booklet. Wow. But the old brown fish and his largemouth books is both spelled incorrectly. If you try to look up his tournament history on Bassmaster.com, his, his name is misspelled. Yep. Um, it, it's wrong everywhere. But it was just that he thought when he was signing it, when he was signing autographs and so forth, it was easier to, to leave out that last <laughs> E, which I think is hilarious. Uh, um, yeah, I feel like a fool. You know, because <laughs> I would I, I see um, someone on the on the internet on a board back in the you know late nineties or something spelling his name with the e, and it's like his name wasn't spelled with an e. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the but, cyber but police, was. right? <laughs> and yeah, and that was that that was the reason he gave. Um, oh my uh, god! Unfortunately, uh, Billy died in late 2002. He had a heart attack in his home in Salina on September 25th, 2002. He never regained consciousness. He died a few days later on September 30th in a, 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 a Cookville, Tennessee hospital. Uh, yeah. There is a mural of all things, a mural in uh, downtown Salina. And I say downtown with a, uh, with a little <laughs> air quotes, asterisk, air quotes. Yeah. Uh, downtown slide depicting Westmoreland fighting a big smallmouth bass. He's not identified in the mural, but it's very obvious who it is. And it was painted in, uh, very long after his death. I don't know if it still exists, but uh, fortunately I grabbed some pictures of that thing when it was still pretty new. Um, he's buried in Fitzgerald Cemetery and Fitzgerald Cemetery. I'm sorry, in Salina, Tennessee. And we've got some uh, pictures of that as well as headstone. Uh, depicts a fishing scene with a leaping smallmouth bass under the words fishing forever. Underneath his name and dates of birth and death, it says a great fisherman, a great uncle, a great brother. Appropriate. Terry, what's your takeaway? Billy Westmoreland, the greatest smallmouth angler of all time. Without a doubt. Undisputed. Um, I don't care what anybody else says. You know, it, he, he'll always be my idol with respect to smallmouth fishing and one of my top five idols, probably in bass fishing, definitely the top ten. Uh, you know, you, you you take a guy out of the the mountains of of Tennessee and you send him to Florida, and you don't expect him to do well. He excelled everywhere he went. It didn't matter where he went. He was competitive. I mean, he placed in the, I think he placed in the top thirty in every single tournament that he fished those seven years or six years that he was on the Bassmaster Trail until they changed the 14-inch limit. I mean, it was – you look at his, his stats in Bassmaster.com. It's amazing. And, uh, yeah, no, I mean, he's without a doubt the, the number one smallmouth fisherman that has ever lived. Yeah, nobody's close in my opinion. Um, I want to share one more story 
about Billy Westmoreland uh, that I learned only after he had passed away. He passed away, as we say, in September of uh, 2002. And, uh, you know, he talked about hooking into that world record on Christmas Day, 1970. And we talked about that at length in this show. Yeah. Um, after hearing that story, I went around to a bunch of his buddies because I, I was curious about where did he hook into this fish? What part of the lake, what point was he fishing where he hooked into this fish? And so I started talking to a lot of the guys who uh, knew Westmoreland far better than I ever did. And I said, hey, did he ever share with you where he hooked this fish? Well, Terry, I found out that he shared with all of them where he wow. hooked this fish. Yeah. All of them. He told them all. But he told them all a different place. <laughs> <laughs> I'd open up my map of Dale Hollow oh. and they'd say, yeah, it was right here. It was this point right here. And then the next <laughs> I would show is this point right here. The next I would show is this point right here. And I'd say, but uh, I, and, and to a man, what, once I started getting that story that, that everybody had a different point that Westmoreland had told them, I, I said, well, you know, Joe Bob told me this and, and, and Jerry told me that. And, and, and Bill told me this, and, and they would all look at me with dead seriousness, Terry, and they would say, no, but he, he shared the real place with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's awesome. That is cool. Isn't that so, awesome? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he's a typical fisherman, right? You know, go find your own to the, fish. <laughs> to the bitter end, yeah. Find your own fish. Uh, the legend of the lake, uh, Billy Westmoreland, uh, the best smallmouth bass fisherman of all time. Uh, it's going to be hard to, it's going to be hard to replace that guy as the yeah. number one smallmouth angler of all time. Uh, I think to get there, you're going to have to catch multiples over 10. Mm -hmm. He did it in the large mouth category and the small mouth category. Yeah. Uh, the legend of the lake indeed. Yep. I was just going to say, if you want to follow us down this rabbit hole of bass fishing history and take a little bit deeper dive into the Billy Westmoreland story, be sure to, to read them old brown fish. It's yeah. long out of print, but you can certainly find a copy on eBay or abebooks.com. Uh, unfortunately, there are not a lot of videos out there about Westmoreland or showing Westmoreland. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what's happened to his television shows from the 1980s. They were called Billy Westmoreland's Fishing Diary. Yep. If you can track any of that stuff down, you will benefit from it, I assure you. And anyway, you, sir, you were slamming the door. Well, before I'm going to do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pump the Bass Fishing Archives website real quick. Uh, this is Smallmouth Magazine. At the time, it was Smallmouth Newsletter put out by Tom Rogers. Uh, Billy Westmoreland was a contributor to this, uh, what turned into a magazine after the leaflets. I have the first two years of this published, or actually the first year and a half published, on the Bass Fishing Archives website if you're interested in reading more from Billy Westmoreland. So anyway. Yes, yeah, Smallmouth Magazine was terrific. Didn't uh, last that long, but terrific. And the Bass Fishing Archives is the only place you're going to find it and the best source you're going to find for uh, bass fishing history information. So it's uh, bassarchives.com or bass-archives.com. Uh, so go over there and, and check it out. But anyway, yeah, it's time to slam the door. Uh, I'm Terry Battisti. On behalf of my partners, Ken Duke and Nathan uh, Benson, thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed the program, please subscribe, like, tell your friends, share it, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to make this, uh, you know, give it, give this a good go. Um, it's going to help us build an audience and then find support to continue on with the show. And uh, also, it will guarantee that you catch a giant bass. Uh, if you'd like to contact us, our email addresses are ken at thebigbasspodcast.com, nathan at thebigbasspodcast.com, and terry at thebigbasspodcast.com. Be sure to check back next week. We'll have a new show about a different big bass with the information that you will not and cannot find anywhere else, and we guarantee that.